Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'll show you a case from uh, something like three months ago. It's a relatively young lady in her 50s that came from Alaska urgently in cardiogenic shock to uh, our center. Creatinine of three on inotropes. And this is her echo. She has a failed Magna 19 in aortic position, Magna 27 in the mitral position. So we go to our surgeon, she's a young lady, 50s. And he said, yeah, I'm probably willing to operate. She's not intubated. She's already consented for very high risk double valve surgery while she's in cardiogenic shock, which I was really surprised that it was even considered. And then she said, by the way, I'm a Jehovah Witness. I'm, I will not accept blood. <laughs> so he said, Danny, please. <laughs> it's too much. So we see that the mitral is a severe, severe MAS. We see that the aortic is abnormal. She has also severe AS and aortic regurgitation, young lady. And we see another thing. You can see, only in retrospect, I understood that, that this is the left main. See that the leaflet of the Magna 19 will clearly occlude the left main when we do tower here. So there, not, there is no, not enough time to do like full analysis and she's in also renal failure, but one shot at least here during the case, and this is like, we need to improvise during the case, when we understand that she is high risk for coronary obstruction. So what should be, I'd be happy if we can like stop for a second and talk about the sequence. What do we do? She has mitral, aortic issues. She is, what should be first? She's here for transcatheter treatment. There is no other approach. She's also high risk for coronary obstruction with aortic valve involved. Should we target the aortic first, the mitral first? What do we do with the risk for coronary obstruction? If I'll open up for discussion. Hi. Danny, with full disclosure, I think I've seen this at a local uh, meeting, so I'll uh, pass it on. But uh, uh, the uh, big thing that I would say is I usually uh, think about these cases that the aortic outflow would be one of the first things to do. But you'll, uh, as you know, there's the left coronary that needs to be evaluated and taken care of. And I think the name of the, pers the, name of the talk is going to give us a clue as to how you'll do it. I think my question would also be if you do the mitral first, how can you... Can you predict LVOT obstruction once you have to do with both valves? How would you plan that out? Because if you do the same procedure, you don't get another chance, right? <clears throat> Unless you do two procedures. It's true. Uh, it seems that working on the aortic position, at least to me, with all that stagnation of blood in, in the LA, she will just die. We'll start working on the aortic valve and she will just die in the room. And also, it, it's clear after understanding that she is high risk for left main obstruction. We can put stents and do what, what we did before, but the right way to do is to do basilica and to, to cut that left cusp leaflet. It doesn't make sense with all of the material that she has here to, to do the mitral implant first and then to do basilica with the snaring and all that in the LVOT. There will be too much material to work in so the basilica cannot happen after the mitral valve in valve, but we cannot do the aortic before treating the mitral because of the stagnation in the, in the LA. So it's a very complex scenario, but I think that we, we got the right sequence by doing BMV, doing starting Sentinel. We use Sentinel routinely in all of our tower cases in our center. We started with a gentle mitral valvuloplasty, 14 millimeter balloon, transeptal, and she, is, uh, she improved a lot already after that maneuver. So now we have a lady that is not stable, but not in cardiogenic shock, in the room for aortic and mitral valve in valve. So the sequence is a bit more uh, normal. So this is a basilica approach to the left cusp, it was, uh, the traversal was AL3, and the uh, six French back, by then, back then, I used uh, eight French since then, and IM 
and then a stato and piggyback crossing, and there is a snare in the LVOT. And this is the leaflet laceration, which he tolerated well. And then I had time, since there is a lot of ambiguity in this case, I used a two coronary protection system. We rarely use coronary protection now in basilica cases, but back then, because of lack of understanding of the risk, I did use it. And we did, since it's a very small valve and not a very small lady, we did a BVF with a 20 true balloon. And since we had a lot of ambiguity about her anatomy, we, I just used the 20 sepian 3 valve. Unfortunately, you see that the left main is terribly close there, but there is no coronary obstruction. You can say that in general, we, there are around 55 uh, basilica cases to date, and the, the procedure looks very reassuring. I think it would be the procedure of choice for prevention of coronary obstruction. This is the RCA. Mitral valve in valve was performed, and this is the last shot. And it went well. Afterwards, she came back to Alaska, and follow up, she looks very good. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for staying on time. You have another minute. Maybe questions from the audience? I might have done the whole Michael first. You were just worried about the tabber part? I thought that doing basilica after a full mitral implant is uh, more challenging. After the valvuloplasty and the mitral position, it, it looked more, I kept a pictel in the LA after doing the transeptal and after doing the valvuloplasty, and I just uh, did routine tran uh, basilica to the left cusp. I thought that the full frame of sapien 3 in the mitral position would make the snaring, and you know, you can go with a stato through the aortic valve, and then you can grab that wire after it went through the sapien 3 frame. It could be a nightmare. But, uh, I think overall, a uh, great case, Danny, and we'll move on to our next speaker to stay on time. So uh, I blew it by uh, Dr. Atiziani, if you'd come up to the stage. All right, thanks for the invitation. Okay, so this is an eight-year-old male that we did this, this case probably one or two months ago, two months ago, actually. Uh, uh, prior surgery, uh, he had a um, stentless bioprosthetic freestyle valve, 20, 29 millimeters. It was 16 years prior to this uh, current presentation, and then he showed up in our AED with a one week of worsening dyspnea and lightheadedness. He had an echo one, one year prior to this admission showing a normal ejection fraction with a uh, trivial uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve insufficiency. <clears throat> and now currently progressively short, uh, more short of breath, uh, with abdominal discomfort, uh, you know, two sets of saturation uh, below 90%. Even he was in three liters of nasal cannula, and blood pressure was very soft, as you can see there. <clears throat> that was the AKG, really not really remarkable. This is the transthoracic echo that was done when the patient was admitted. And this patient, interestingly, he was not uh, initially admitted to our structural heart service, so he was, he was admitted to a, one of our uh, surgeons at the hospital, and we were not consulted in the very beginning of this admission. They read the echo as moderate AI, but clinically, this patient had clearly severe aortic regurgitation going on. Cath, a remarkable. And as you can see, the orthogram, you're going to see severe aortic insufficiency going on there. So this patient was capped uh, by the surgeon in the um, CICU, and he had planned for a redo sternotomy, a redo AVR. Uh, remember, he's 80 years old. 
So he was kept in medical management uh, in the CICU. Then 48 hours later, he was kept in dopamine. 48 hours later, we were uh, consulted because the patient was just not doing well and he had not been taken to the OR. And obviously at that moment, I said, we have to take this patient now uh, and do a valve involve on him. <clears throat> These are the measurements of the CTA. So you can see perimeter of 93, um, wide sinus, um, low coronaries, but very wide sinus. No other remarkable things. The access is very good. So we, we do all of our cases in local anesthesia with, low, with um, just mild sedation. This patient specifically, he, he could not even lay flat, so we ended up taking him uh, to the hybrid OR and uh, general anesthesia with TE guidance. This is the TE uh, interprocedure. That was the procedure. It was a very uneventful uh, procedure. I implanted a Evolut R34, um, no recapture. It was a very, very smooth intervention. <clears throat> Great result. At this point, everybody was uh, high in five there. Um, so the um, diastolic blood pressure improved. LVDP came down, so we were very happy. Blood pressure, he was hemodynamically stable. Then I left that day. I went to, a, there was an outreach dinner with some of our referring physicians. I was starting to have a glass of wine, and I was paged. It was around 8.30. Um, that the patient was not doing well in the CTICU. Uh, hypotensive, MAPS in the 40s, they started drips, epi, norepi, and the bedside echo showed a left ventricular ejection fraction of 15%. If you remember, the initial one was around 45-ish. Uh, apparently, no cardiac tamponade in the bedside echo. I obviously went back to the hospital and thought, well, I've, something happened in this case. I'm not, I was not quite sure what was going on. Uh, tamponade, apparently no tamponade. Coronary occlusion, obviously, is a, is a concern here. Eventually, a PE, or just inflammatory response of the you know, cardiogenic shock. This patient waited too long to be treated. So, and if that's the fourth option, it's we blew it because they kept this patient too long uh, until he was uh, finally treated. Took him back to the, OR, to the cath lab, took the root shot, there was no coronary occlusion, and honestly, my suspicions for coronary occlusion was very low here with his wide sinus. It's extremely highly unlikely that he would occlude his coronaries, and in fact, there's no occlusion to the coronaries there. At this point, you see the swan, the swan catheter there. I put a, a, a transtramoral uh, impella CP. Still, I was not happy uh, with the numbers. He, this, this patient is a little, relatively big guy. Um, so I decided to um, upsize the impella for a 5-0 impella. So we, we, did the, we did so. The numbers improved a little bit when we, we uh, upsized to the 5 0 The wedge came down, uh, and his blood pressure was stable, uh, and his PEPI was 1.3, uh, so he was not in severe RV failure, although he had some baseline uh, RV dysfunction to start. So we, we treated his uh, RV dysfunction with murinone and epiprostanol. He, kept, he was kept with the Impella uh, 5 0 and was progressively weaned from epinephrine. So at that point, there was no coronary occlusion, no tamponade, uh, and the hypothesis is just that we sat for too long in this patient, and when he was taken to uh, the um, uh, OR, he was uh, probably too late. And as you can see here, the renal function panel, CBC, uh, and uh, the lactate of this patient, this is a very, uh, these are very interesting to, to pay attention to because after we gave him the hemodynamic support that he just needed at that point, the, all of his uh, labs progressively improved. And this is what happened with him, right? So he was, uh, they waited too long, uh, 48 hours sitting on that patient with severe acute AI. And we almost uh, reached to the point that the spiral of shock would be not reversible, but thankfully we were able to give him an, an, enough hemodynamic support to reverse that. Um, the Impella 5 was removed uh, in the day six post-intervention, uh, and he was sent home uh, on day 13 uh, post-intervention. These are the echoes that we have there. So the pre transthoracic echo, the, the first day post-procedure, as you can see, biventricular failure there at PO uh, D5, much imp uh, significant improvement there. And then this is the follow-up echo. Uh, this patient is doing really well now. Uh, and I just saw him like a couple of weeks ago in clinic and he's doing really, really great.
just to take some uh, take home messages here, we have to know the differential diagnosis for uh, cardiogenic shock post TAVR. Timely intervention is extremely important. And we always say that uh, emergent or urgent TAVR is not a very good thing to do, but in these patients with severe acute AI, definitely we should uh, make a decision very fast and not to wait too long because if they go in the spiral of shock, that's going to be probably irreversible, which almost happened with this patient. Um, thank you very much, Dash. We, we heard a lot of um, nice talks from Joao and others for imaging, and of course you don't have time in this case, but it would be interesting to see an MRI, right, in this, this case. Yeah, but, yeah, definitely, but we just didn't have time. It was, yeah, it was extremely... No chance for doing it afterwards, just to see if there's any kind of substrate in his ventricle? Yeah, we, we ended up not doing, because, because he recovered. The clinical course was, so we ended up just not doing anything. If, if the clinical course had not been this recovery, the really impressive recovery that he had, of course, I, I think uh, we, we should have done something, but we ended up not doing it. Mario, the, um, just for the panel and maybe even for the audience, one of the things is a great recognition, great save, especially in the escalation to 5-0, because you really yeah. are, and your picture is beautiful about the spiral. Um, more and more, uh, especially as a heart team approach, cardiologist and surgeon, we have a lower threshold for ECMO and moving to that sooner than later. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, and just everybody else's perspective, but yeah. uh, we we now have almost that service where we're just skipping a step at times. We we ended we end, no we ended up uh, scanning uh, Paul at some point um, uh, when he was in the CTSU. There was a concern, but that was like. I don't remember specifically what day that was, but yeah, there were, there was, we scanned his head, there was no, no issues going on, yeah. And nothing to suggest coronary embolism? Nothing, nothing, nothing. EKG was okay. Uh, I, I, indeed, I, I took him to the lab right immediately to, to I took that child, the angiogram, there was a, but no EKG changes, nothing, yep. You gave me a good, a good <laughs> bottle of wine, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going we're gonna to invite Dr. Greenbaum to the stage. OK. Um, so um, there, there is a case here that I'm going to show you, but I also I do want to show you some things about Lampoon uh, concepts because actually of all the things, uh, this is one that still confuses um, people probably the most of, uh, of these procedures. And the other thing I want to tell you is, uh, so I've had the honor of being uh, helped bring uh, three sort of novel techniques uh, to everybody, right, Transcable, Lampoon, and, and Basilica. And, and interestingly, of those three, we have now heard of more failures of uh, Lampoon and Basilica, then actually all transcable, all, all, all kidding aside, there's been like one failed transcable in the entire world, like out of 600 cases, and there's been this cropping up failures, and I think it's because um, people don't understand quite all the concepts. I think everybody understands that um, there's an LVOT obstruction risk here, right? It's all fun and games until this happens to you and the patient dies, and everybody understands that it's a flow issue, right? Um, this is not... This is flow, right? The pink here is what's inside the chamber when you put that uh, sapien valve in. Sometimes there is simply not enough room, right? But there's also another issue that people don't understand, which is independent of flow, and that is that the leaflet can be an issue. These long, redundant leaflets cause problems. They cause SAM. They cause all sorts of issues here, right? And the surgeons don't have those leaflets there. Now, um, techniques. I don't know why that one picture is not there, but here are your options to prevent that, right? So this is what is being thrown out there, right? You can do an alcohol, a preparatory alcohol septulation, meaning you modify the LVOT diameter itself, right? Or you can try and reorient the transcatheter valve, and there are two ways to do that, right? I've done pull A, and then there's, you can put a balloon in there to try and um, orient the valve away from the LVOT. And then, of course, you can just resect the leaflets, or you can do this lampoon thing. Now, I have done all of these, just so you know, so if, if you want to know my opinion about all of them, I'm happy to tell you afterwards. So here's the lampoon thing, right? <laughs> the, what people don't understand here is you need two retrograde catheters, right? You have to burn from under the leaflet through the base of the leaflet at A2. So you need to use transcatheter electrosurgery. 
All the snare does, it's not necessarily a target, the echo tells you where to go, but you do need to grab it to create the loop, right? This is the exact same thing that's done in Basilica also. This is just the anterior leaflet of the mitra valve. And now you need to electrify the side of the wire, right? First you had to electrify the tip, now you have to electrify the side because you're gonna slice from base to leaflet. Is everybody clear on that? So the failure, so, so here's a very first case done. I flew down to Emory and uh, my good friend Vasilis, now my partner, we did the very first one in, in May of 2016. And then a couple of days later, my patient was lined up and we came back to Ford. And this is the very first case that I did at Ford, number two in the world. Here's what it looks like. You just need the LVOT view, right? And you need to just electrify and burn through. You'll see bubbles in the left atrium. This happened to be a patient with a ring, so you can see the rings are great because you got good landmarks in there. So it doesn't even matter where the snare is. The snare is just to grab it later, okay? Now, uh, one quick concept about Lampoon is there were about three cases we did early on that still failed and we couldn't figure out why until Jaffer actually, actually it was Melissa Fusari actually from Edwards who said, well, the ventricle is so small that actually the skirt of the valve itself is obstructive because there's 12, 11, 12, 13 millimeters of skirt, right? And if all of that's in the ventricle, you split the leaflet and now you just put skirt there. So, so we developed this concept called the skirt neo iliot so if you're gonna do this procedure, what we do is we put a virtual valve in there, we measure the Neo-LVOT, and then we have made a virtual valve that's only 12 millimeters. And we put it at 80-20 and we say, okay, what's the Neo-LVOT here? Because you can't correct that at all. Does that make sense? So if you ask me to do a CT for you, you're gonna get three measurements. You get a Neo-LVOT, you get a skirt Neo-LVOT, and then you get a bailout Neo-LVOT, which is a whole other issue, which is what if you screw up and the whole thing's back in the atrium? Can you put another one in? Because if you do lampoon, right, and you put a valve inside a valve, now the leaflets of the transcatheter valve are your original problem. So, if you, so we say if your Neo-LVOT is less than 150, you're in trouble, but your skirt Neo-LVOT has to be greater than 150 to do the procedure. Is that a clear concept? Okay. This is what it looks like when the wire goes through the base of the leaflet from the surgeon's view. Okay, this is the secret of the procedure. It's called the Flying V. For those of you who don't know, it was a famous Gibson guitar made in the 50s. Famously, a psychedelic version played by Jimi Hendrix. So he gets credit as the most famous person to play it, but many uh, guitar players use this. But to get the wire to electrify out the side, this is a bath showing that you can do it, you need to denude a little bit of the wire and kink it so that the denuded part is on the lesser curvature of the wire, because electricity wants to go at the greater curve, right? Think about it, if you bend a wire, the electricity wants to go straight. So if you do it and make the flying V correctly, it's a very easy pull. But you have to know that that's the secret, you have to create the flying V. Um, so here's what it looks like, here's the pull, and here's what the split looks like. These people do well hemodynamically because the leaflets still coapt normally as they do in the aortic position. And this is what the V-gram would look like after the one that didn't do a V-gram on the first patient, so this is actually the second patient I did, a number three in the world. The valve can be completely across touching the septum, and flow will now go through it. This patient clearly would have obstructed had there not been. And here you'll see on the LVOT view from TEE, you will see the cage coming all the way across, but you will see flow through the cage. So I wanted to spend some time on the intricacies of why people are failing, and I think it's because they're not asking for help and they don't understand the subtle things that you need to do to get the procedure done. There's been over 60 cases done now. The 30 patient ID is completed. We'll hopefully re reveal the 30 day results at TCT. Two other quick things. Failed Alfieri stitch in a ring with severe MR. We have modified Lampoon so that you can split this leaflet. Now this is an easier procedure, it's the same exact thing, but you don't have to burn through the base of the leaflet, just go through one orifice, split to the other, get rid of the alfieri stitch, and now put your valve in. This has been published called Elastic, and we know that it works for mitral clips also. So, you could potentially remove any clip, it's gonna stay on the posterior leaflet, just move it off the anterior leaflet, now you have an SLDA, and put your valve in. There's another thing that happens even with these transcatheter valves for the future. Tendine has this problem where sometimes the leaflet doesn't cause LV obstruction, but there's dynamic SAM from the leaflet. So done in an animal, there's an animal model that you can do in pigs and then actually done in the human as well. So 
you can use Lampoon even with transcatheter valves to handle some of these issues. I think it's a more elegant solution than alcohol septal ablation. It's all one procedure. No delay, it can handle. We've done neoableates that are less than zero. So, it's doable. It doesn't appear to affect valve stability, increased PVL, stroke risk, and can be done with alveolar stitch, potentially mitral clips, but you need to ask for help. You need to come watch cases. You need to under, understand the subtleties of the flying V. We inject dextrose so that we get the salt away from the wire so that it burns so the two catheters are hooked up to glucose at the time. So there's a couple things that you can't see when you look at the YouTube video, and I think that's why people are failing. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the specifics of the procedure after, but that is Lampoon in a nutshell. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, Adam, obviously you've been one of the main people that has really put this whole thing forward. Um, what are the, if somebody's thinking about trying their first lampoon, the most common questions that people ask you that are not in this YouTube video um, and not in this presentation, what are the other two or three things you are really want to make sure from patient selection, from planning, from even just setup of the lab, is there anything else that are the top three, four things that you also want to add in the next 20 seconds? So, they, so uh, things I failed to mention for the procedures, we create an AV loop, right? So basically you go transeptal through the mitral valve and out the aortic valve and you grab it and you snare it. The reason for that AV loops is so you have a rail so that your retrograde catheter that has to go up in the LA for the snare, if it falls back, you know, you can just easily go in and out. But what's key about that loop that you create is you need to be in the center of the mitral valve, not under any cords when you come out. So there are some maneuvers we do to make sure that that's free. Because otherwise when you lasso, if you lasso around a cord, right, you're, you're going to rip the fat muscle of the cords and you're going to have severe amount and the patient may not tolerate that part of it, right? So there are some subtle things that you need to do that have all been worked out. The similar things have been worked out with Basilica. The overall technique, right, Basilica is a modification of Lampoon, so the flying V and the catheters, and that's all the same, but there are some subtle things that we do to prevent mishaps in that as well. And so all I'm saying is come to Emory, watch a case, come to Seattle, watch a case, um, and have somebody there to help you because these are incredible techniques to handle real problems. I do think Basilica is the future. I think we'll, I don't know why we're not splitting every valve before we put one in, because no surgeon leaves any valves behind. So let's just start, let's just throw that out there and say, if it was a five minute procedure as part of your tavern, you would just do it, right? So, um, but I don't want people to fail and I don't want people to say these techniques don't work, because they do, you just have to know how to do them. Fair enough, Danny? Let's do it all. Let's get it out of the way. <laughs> anyway. So bottom line is ask for help, yes? Ask for help. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we ask the Dr. Cohen to come up? Thanks so much uh, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here with friends. Uh, my presentation no, is not as fancy as uh, Adam's, and uh, this is a little bit like back to the future. This is how Tavern uh, all started um, a long time ago. Um, we just had to do it, and we had to do it out of need because um, our patients were needing treatment at the time uh, that um, we didn't have that many resources available as we are now. We didn't understand much on how to manage these patients and all these new advances and using the, <clears throat> the Bobby to, to cut electrically stuff. So the, so again, I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go back to how we started. Um, this transeptal integrate tower was described initially by Crivier, and that's how the first uh, human cases of tower uh, were, were done, but then people steered away from them because of this laceration uh, to the mitral, to the anterior mitral leaflet and severe MR um, after, uh, after tower. Um, we developed multiple access options, especially five years ago. Um, we had a group of patients that would not qualify for the trials, <coughs> that would not have any approach feasible, and the, and, the, and the resources we had were not good for treating um, the patient. So this is one patient. This is how we all resumed uh, doing TAVR. So this is somebody that was referred to us from Jacksonville. We were, I think, one of the first uh, sites doing TAVRs in Florida were there with Bill O'Neill. 
And uh, I had an old video from Crevier on how he did the first cover, so he had all the steps uh, into that video, and I, I had uh, Bill that had done the first uh, uh, transeptal integrates towers in, in the country with some of the results that I showed with laceration of the, of the mitral leaflet. So the surgeon said no, no to transapical, no to transaortic, and there was no possibilities of doing transfemoral um, because uh, the devices that, in that, at that time needed at least seven millimeters of uh, diameter. So the STS uh, score was high. The patient was not a surgical candidate. When she presented initially, I did a BAV, took her off the, took her off the vent, and would send her back to Jacksonville. Then three months later, I get a call again from Jacksonville saying that the patient is back in the hospital. So we had to come up with an idea. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then we, we put ourselves together, looked at the video, developed a plan, created a PowerPoint. We posted all those pictures in the, in the cath lab so we could follow a plan, and we were three Three, to, three people plus a fellow doing this case, two at the right side of the patient and one at the left side of the patient. So vascular axis consisted of, uh, of, uh, of uh, arterial and venous axis in each one of the, in, 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 in each side, right and left. We use uh, the ultrasound for axis uh, always. Um, we first did uh, an integrate, a retrograde, uh, a retrograde BAV just to make room for the, uh, make room for the valve. And this was, and then we uh, exchanged the venous, the right venous sheet for that uh, retroflex uh, sheet that was used in the first generation uh, cases in the beginning. As you can see, <coughs> this looks <coughs> more like a mitral clip than anything like the sheath of a mitral clip. So uh, then we did the transeptal. Uh, Bill was doing here the transeptal without the guidance, as you can see. Um, and, but the, the transeptal had to be in the posterior, uh, more in the posterior uh, aspect of the, of the, of the fossa valley, so we had room to make a loop. We had uh, two pigtails, one in the aortic valve, one in the ventricle. Um, we have uh, a pacemaker, and we have the patient uh, here with this one, I think we, we probably put from the arm. So the first part was to establish the, the, the loop, the ventricular loop. So we went with uh, one of those Medtronic blue catheters that have a, a balloon there. Those are nice seven French catheters that we would um, float through with a molding sheet through the LV uh, into the outflow track and then in the aorta and then advance, uh, advance a wire into the descending aorta. The key here was to use uh, um, a nitinol wire, the nitrix wire, because this wire is on kink. And that would, uh, if, you, if you keep the loop uh, loose, then you would avoid um, injuring the mitral valve and, uh, and uh, mitral regurgitation. So that was the key, use a 400 centimeter EV3 nitrix intermediate wire. Uh, then, uh, once we got into the descending aorta, we used one of those uh, three-lobe snares um, just to grab the, the nitrix wire and, and externalize it from the other side. Then from the other side, using that same wire, we would advance uh, a multipurpose guiding catheter just with, to stabilize the position of the valve, and I'll show you now. But before that, we had to, before going with the valve, we had to do a septosomy, open, open, make some room there uh, for the for the valve to pass, and initially we used a 10 or a 12 millimeter uh, balloon, but uh, then we found out that using that XXL Boston Scientific 16 by 40 esophageal balloon gave us more room, and then the valve would hang up less in the, in the, in the transeptal. So the next uh, thing was preparation, and here there was lots of, uh, lots of improvisation and, and creativity. We didn't have that many resources, uh, and that many balloons. The true balloon was not available at that time. We only had a Z-Med. So we used uh, the crimper from another valve, and uh, <coughs> we used the measurements. We used volumetric expansion, and uh, we created our delivery system uh, by crimping the valve into uh, a Z-Med balloon the similar way that Crivier did it uh, in the beginning. Um, so this is the critical part. Uh, when we are pushing the valve and somebody is holding a little bit of tension from the other side, and the, the best part is when the loop is created and then everything reconstitutes because it, there's torsion to the heart at that point and the blood pressure just tanks down until you recreate that loop uh, and then you get your, your um, transcatheter valve there in your ascending path. 
So two people have to be in control, one in each side of the patient. And here, um, as you can see here, there is a catheter that will, that will top the, 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 the transcatheter heart valve uh, balloon delivery system and prevent it from just a watermelon sitting forward into the, into the aorta. So this is a critical part here, uh, measuring that uh, we are at the right place um, with the valve, trying to be as coaxial as you can. You have control from both sides. And this is the, the valve deployment under, um, under rapid pacing. So the idea is to just keep tight control of the, of the retrograde catheter so the valve doesn't advance into the, into the, into the ascending aorta. So, and this is, this is obviously, I'm gonna show one of the best results we had. <laughs> so this is, uh, so then we, we pull the wire back uh, and then we leave a, a, a pigtail, uh, a pigtail, we protect the, the mitral valve with a pigtail so we're pulling the nitrix wire from the loop and this is the final result <coughs> with one of the early uh, sapien valves. So the patient did well, and then two hours later, uh, we were, you know, we were very satisfied that the venous, and this is what we see with venous procedures that uh, these are relatively benign. We didn't put a, a large hole uh, in this patient, and she was having, uh, she was, she was having some, some, some uh, platane and some Cuban stuff there, on the bed. So. <laughs> So then uh, we continued to do these cases. We did these cases in patients that were really uh, difficult at that time. Um, and um, we did uh, nine cases uh, in a row in a couple of, I think in one case we could not advance uh, past the mitral valve and we had to retrieve the, the valve because we were just not able to do it. So it talks to how the technique could be, uh, could be improved if needed and I just ran into Bill and and uh, he's uh, developing now a transeptal antigrade technique and going through the IJ as opposed to going from, from below. Um, so in conclusion for, for, for this uh, technique, I think uh, remains an option. Um, it's available for whoever wants to do it. It's very involved, needs lots of uh, manipulation and, and control, antigrade and retrograde. Um, should be done by, by operators who know what they're doing and um, Using the nitinal wire appeared that to be uh, important, just maintain a wide ventricular loop and avoid severe MR or damage the mitral valve. Uh, um, just putting this in perspective, I think that our equipment has now evolved. At the time we did this, only 50% of cases could be done transfemorally. Now, approximately 90% of patients uh, can be done transfemorally. So these, all these alternatives become very niche procedures. We're doing very few alternative access cases. And now trans, transaxillary that was not available at that time for the Edwards valve, that was the only one approved, now is, uh, is, is, another, is another option. And transcable is also another option that may obviate the, the possibility, the, the, the ventricular loop and, and damaging the mitral valve. So this is what I had. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, you used ultrasound to get venous access. Yes. But you didn't use it to get transeptal access. Correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you must not care too much about where you puncture the septum. Huh, for yes, this. And, and these were cases done uh, in the beginning. And I think that with all the things that we know about transeptal access and where in the fossa you want to you want to go, I think it's, you know, if you do mitral clips, if you do left atrial appendage closure and whatever you want to do, I think I would not recommend going blind and, and puncturing tra transeptal blind. This is a skill that um, early operators have by just uh, going by, 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 by feel, and I don't think that you need to go by feel anymore, yeah. to be precise. No transcaval, no transaxillary cases. Occluded aorta. One out of 10,000 patients. Mm -hmm. And then you don't even need to go femoral because all you need the retrograde access is to just maintain the valve, prevent the valve from, from, from moving forward. 
But I think it's, it's good to know. It's, I think it's good to know that it's available. Um, all these steps have been described recently in Paul's uh, atlas of cases. And we also described the technique a few years ago in that uh, CCI paper from 2013. Was it performed with new cloud system? Hmm? Was it performed with Sapien 3? Was, uh, no, no Sapien 3 at the time. It was, uh, was performed with the original Sapien and uh, an Azimet balloon. And uh, the sheath was uh, the Retroflex, uh, the Retroflex uh, original sheath that was like 24. I think we, this was a 23 valve. One of the things we learned is that the crimp valve would not go very well on the 24 sheet. We had to use a 26 French sheet uh, to do it. And I think the transapical was 28 French at the time. So we used a 26 French to deliver the, the 23 millimeter valve. I think at the end of the day, this is a, you know, obviously there's been many developments, but it, the technical aspects of this case are the, probably the most important. How do you challenge this problem? How do you do this problem? How did you do it? And there's a lot to learn from that. So I think thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for sharing that. Thank you. Great, great outcomes. Um, uh, I think one of the, uh, the small pleasures in life is seeing people that uh, you've mentored or grown to know uh, take on to new heights and surpass things that you've done. And with that in place, I'd like to invite Rahul Sharma uh, from the Karelian Clinic to uh, come up and talk about a case of challenging LAA closure. Good morning. Thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words, Samir. Uh, thank you to the course directors for having me and to the panel. Uh, I'm going to talk about my case here. These are my research disclosures. I don't have any financial disclosures. I'll try to stay on time here. Go ahead and advance. Okay. All right, good morning, my name is Rahul Sharma. I'm gonna be talking about a quote-unquote challenging left atrial appendage closure case uh, by uh, traversing through a previous uh, transeptal puncture in a patient that had a prior mitral clip procedure. I guess challenging is in the eye of the beholder, but I think there were some interesting lessons and some, some maybe some thought-provoking questions that we can all talk about at the end of this. So this is a 83-year-old uh, Caucasian male veteran, retired U.S. Air Force, uh, referred for evaluation and treatment of severe mitral regurgitation originally. Uh, had exertional dyspnea, tremendous fatigue, prior hospitalizations for heart failure. You can see he has a severely reduced ejection fraction, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, some CKD, chronic AFib, onapixaban, his has blood, has blood scores 2, uh, CHADS vest score 5, uh, and a distant history of alcoholism. So I got some baseline TE imaging, of course, looked at the mitral valve, planned the uh, percutaneous mitral repair procedure after he had seen a surgeon and was deemed to be um, high prohibitive risk for uh, surgical mitral repair or replacement. I did a right heart cath. You can see his transpulmonary gradient is about seven and uh, his pulmonary vascular resistance was normal. Um, PFTs looked good, carotids looked fine, and he actually was not really very frail at all, looked pretty good for 83, but, um, uh, but was felt to be high risk for surgery. Baseline TE imaging, I'm gonna go through the mitral clip portion very quickly, because I just wanna sort of highlight where the transeptal was done, since it'll be relevant to the LA closure portion of this presentation. You can see it's a fairly central mitral regurgitation jet, A2, P2, there's some thickening of the leaflets, so you can even see in the image on the left that there's a little bit of a torn cord element there. So we felt that this was sort of a mixed ideology MR, uh, albeit he has a severely reduced EF, but we felt that this was a clippable case. He's got some, some trace AI. So here's some 3D images. 3D color on the right. My plan from looking at this imaging was to sort of put two clips right down the center, and so kind of speeding up, I'll go through that. Um, we're all familiar with this image uh, from a paper a couple years ago um, by uh, doctors uh, Alcooli, Rahal, and Holmes talking about some of the stru structural heart interventional procedures that require transeptal access and kind of the recommended areas where one should do puncture. Um, and we think our puncture for the, our mitral clip case in this particular patient was right around there. You see this little red circle that just popped up, sort of very close to the recommended sort of high posterior uh, location for a clip. Uh, the green dot represents where you would want to go for left atrial appendage closure. And what I'll submit uh, in this talk, and what I think many of us have thought about uh, before, is uh, how much do we have to hold ourselves to these locations. Um, so uh, I think this talk may be very um, relevant after some of the last couple of presentations here we've seen this morning about transeptal access and how we are going to start seeing patients who return for repeat transeptal procedures. 
Uh, this is my transeptal puncture point using a bailiff system, which is what we use at our institution. Um, and uh, I deployed two clips as I discussed with you. Uh, the image on the right shows, I think, a pretty satisfactory result. Um, and so after mitral clip procedure, patient noted significant improvement in his dyspnea, still continued to be fairly fatigued, no clear reason for that. Uh, he was on a Pixaban, but he had some falls, uh, started having a lot of bruising, started inquiring actually about left atrial appendage closure, and so we felt that he was a reasonable candidate for that after making some shared decision making with his referring cardiologist. Baseline T imaging for our left atrial appendage closure portion of the case. You can see this is a different view, 0, 45, 90, 135. You can appreciate in the bottom right picture that the 135 view does have uh, an anterior chicken wing. And based on the depth of this particular appendage, the maximum uh, diameter of the uh, left atrial appendage ostium was around 24 uh, in the 90 degree view. Um, so I, I sort of felt kind of pre-procedurally I may end up putting a 27 millimeter Watchman device in this patient. Here's TE imaging on game day for left atrial appendage closure. He's got some TR, not a ton. Clip still looks good, two clips there. Um, and uh, you can see there's still a residual uh, atrogenic uh, atrial septal defect from the mitral clip procedure and there's some X-plane imaging on the right. And here's some 3D imaging, and what really struck me about these pictures, um, you know, as we were prepping him for the Watchman procedure, is you sort of see how that uh, atrial septal defect expands and contracts in atrial systole and diastole, which I think was really cool to see. Uh, you can see kind of the location of the puncture, uh, perhaps uh, not in an ideal location for a standard left atrial appendage case. Uh, on top of which this appendage was an uh, anterior chicken wing. So going with a bailless system, but not really puncturing per se, I sort of directed it where it had to go. I think I applied a little bit of radio frequency, but it sort of went right through um, and uh, went through the same hole. Um, you see the anterior chicken wing here in this ario caudal projection, a left atrial appendage gram, uh, navigated the pigtail up into the wing and uh, used an anterior curved sheath. Here's the uh, watchman sheath inside the appendage. Um, and uh, size it to a 27 millimeter device. And you see the image on the right is after device deployment. Luckily, we did not have to gain too much depth into the anterior wing, but I had to apply a, let's just say, a significant amount of counterclockwise torque to get that uh, sheath in there. Uh, probably a, a function of not, not only the appendage anatomy, but perhaps the transeptal location that I went through not being ideal per se. Um, here's um, imaging right after device deployment in our standard. 0, 45, 90, 135 degree views. Um, I'll just let these images play, but you can see there's uh, no uh, peri device leak or color flow around the device. So we began assessing our past criteria, position, anchor, size, seal, and we were pretty happy. There was good compression, uh, and so we, we released that 27 millimeter Watchman device. Um, here's some imaging. Uh, as I pulled back, I always do a manual LA to RA pullback at the end of any sort of left atrial case just to kind of see, you know, what is the gradient, what does the color flow look like. His gradient um, at that time was about 11 millimeters of mercury, left to right, shunt, uh, and you can see this is kind of the final condition of the uh, atrial septal defect after this Watchman procedure. Here's some more pictures of it, 3D color, left to right on color Doppler. So final gradient of about 11, left to right. Uh, he was extubated, recovered in the PACU after his Watchman procedure, put him on a Pixaban for 45 days, sent him home the next day, limited echo afterwards. The next day looked good, no effusion. 45 days, came back, did a TE in the interest of time. I won't show you those pictures, but there was no leak. The device looked good, uh, no device thrombus, but still a persistent interatrial septal defect with predominant left to right, right, left -to -right flow at that 45-day TE. So um, he completed his 45 days of apixaban, transitioned to DAPT. He had uh, very minor uh, oral bleeding, which was self-limiting, but didn't really have any bleeding issues on apixaban afterwards um, for that short period. Ongoing symptoms of fatigue, uh, still kind of class one symptoms um, in terms of his dyspnea. Uh, obtained follow-up echo imaging actually just the day before I flew here for this conference. Uh, his echo gradient is still about 11 across that atrogenic ASD, and, but he's had progressive right atrial dilatation and his uh, TR is also worsening, so we're gonna plan him for ASD closure. So as some of the topics and kind of conversations, I mean, I think this is gonna increasingly become kind of quote unquote everyday life for us as we start doing more transeptal and repeat transeptal accesses in the same patient. Uh, perhaps at this point, most would say that this is uncommon to have to go through for multiple different transeptal procedures, but I think it's gonna become increasingly common whether it's in a patient who's had a clip and then comes for a watchman or a patient who's had um, a watchman and then comes for an anti-grade tavern in whatever circumstance that would be in and, and other scenarios, PVL closures, et cetera. 
Um, the specific location of the transeptal puncture varies based on the desired procedure. We all know that, but I think the caveat is that in specific scenarios where you have a pre-existing defect, uh, going through that and preventing further insult and injury to the septum seems to make sense to me, and I think in common practice many people would try to do that as long as they could get the procedure done safely. Um, left atrial appendage closure in a challenging anterior chicken wing case can still be done, as I'm sure we've all seen uh, in cases where the transeptal puncture may not be exactly where you would want it to be but oftentimes requires much more negotiation of the watchman um, sheath, whether it's an anterior double curve sheath and a lot of counterclockwise torque. But I think we should consider ASD closure in these patients who've had repeat transeptal punctures uh, or large bore transeptal puncture, let's say for a TMVR or uh, an anti-grade TAVR, whatever it may be. Um, there's a publication from last fall by uh, Toyama et al. And I think Dr. Carr is also on that paper. Uh, demonstrating that these patients, in fact, do come back with increased uh, right heart dilatation, worsening TR, and more heart failure admissions. Um, so even though at the time of the procedure, the gradient may look good, it's predominantly left to right, they don't have any pulmonary hypertension, you think it's okay to leave it alone. And of course, 75% of patients do close their defect, about a quarter have it open at, uh, at follow-up. But I think that there are patients uh, that we've all recognized that should have these closed. Uh, and so I think in, in my patient's case, we will bring him back and do that. Um, thank you for your time. Great case. I think in the interest of time, we're, we're going to go to the next uh, speaker. Dr. Naido, do you still need some extra time? Is he here? No. Then we're going to go with Dr. Kim. Thank you very much to the, uh, the panel and, and to the organizers of the conference for inviting me to present. Um, I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. So similar to Dr. Cohen's presentation earlier, this is a case from a few years ago, and obviously, obviously technology has changed. We may approach a case like this differently and, and may have avoided this complication, but I think this is a, um, the, the issue of LV uh, apical pseudoaneurysms is going to become potentially an issue again uh, with evolving technologies, which I'll comment on later. So this was a 75-year-old female, severe aortic stenosis, class three heart failure, um, a pretty bad peripheral vascular disease with known uh, bilateral FEMPOP bypasses, moderate severe lung disease um, on three liters of chronic supplemental O2, diabetes, she was very frail and a history of chronic pericarditis and actually had pericardial stripping in the 1980s. Um, her estimated STS prom for uh, SAVR was 7%. We felt she was prohibitive risk for SAVR due to frailty and lung disease. And this was back in the days of um, original core valve and Sapien XT, uh, which obviously used larger sheaths. And so our plan at our institution at the time, we were, we were very comfortable with transapical access being a uh, VAD center, a transplant center, and doing lots of transapical cases with original Sapien. And so the original plan was a transapical TAVR with Sapien XT. Uh, annular area was about somewhere between 405 to 415. Um, STJ, 27, and sinuses were generous at 30. So the plan uh, initially was probably a 26, uh, either a 23 or 26 uh, Sapien XT, um, or one could consider a 26 or a 29 core, uh, original core valve at that time. So this was the uh, peripheral vasculature, clearly not amenable to a transfemoral approach, uh, likely not even with today's uh, technology as well. So uh, brought her in for the transapical procedure, and just this was from the uh, surgical report uh, for that index procedure, um, where essentially what was described was just by putting in the sutures, um, the stay sutures, before access was even obtained with the needle, uh, there was comment that there was a lot of bleeding, the tissue was very friable, um, couldn't get good hemostasis, and so the feeling was if we had accessed this uh, patient with you know, an 18 or a 20 French E sheath, uh, through the apex that um, there, there'd be a really re huge risk to her life in terms of not uh, obtaining hemostasis at the end of the procedure. So uh, the procedure was aborted. Uh, they put several horizontal mattress, uh, pledged mattress stitches down just to stop the bleeding and the oozing from the, uh, you know, just from the needles. Um, had sufficient hemostasis at that time, took the patient off the table, and then tried to come up with plan B, which plan B at the time was then either do a direct aortic approach with either a sapien or a uh, core valve uh, with the feeling that it was kind of borderline in terms of height, in terms of what we needed in her ascending aorta. And so we looked at the subclavian and felt that it was probably amenable to do this from the subclavian, um, left subclavian approach uh, through a conduit. It'd be, it'd be snug, but we thought we could do it. 
um, and uh, go with the Medtronic core valve at that point in time. However, we had this not so in incidental finding on that repeat CT to look at our subclavians um, where our uh, cardiac uh, radiologist called us down and said, you may want to come and see this. And we took a look at it and said, well, that's not good. So there was a pretty prominent LV apical pseudoaneurysm that had formed in the few weeks uh, since our index procedure um, coming right from the site uh, that was accessed with the needles. And it measured a neck of about three millimeters with a pseudoaneurysm uh, dimensions of 12 by 24 millimeters. So not a small pseudoaneurysm by any means. So then we went to plan C, uh, which was treat the uh, aortic stenosis first with a 29 millimeter core valve through a sheath technique from the uh, left subclavian through a, a eight millimeter surgical conduit. We would uh, prep for a, a backup bailout direct aortic approach if we couldn't get the sheath through the subclavian. And then once the uh, aortic valve was, was taken care of, then we would address the issue of the LV apical pseudoaneurysm with plans to place uh, most likely an amplots or duct occluder two uh, via a retrograde approach from the same uh, subclavian access site. So the, uh, the deployment of the Medtronic uh, core valve at the time was unremarkable, pretty straightforward procedure. It was a little tough getting the uh, 18 French sheath uh, down into where we needed to in the ascending aorta, but got it down and, and then the uh, valve procedure overall was unremarkable. Nice result there. And so this was our aortogram after, or sorry, our ventricular gram after, and you can see clear flow into that uh, enlarging pseudoaneurysm sac, looks larger on angiography than it did on CT. Um, and so we knew that that needed to get taken care of. So our approach to this was, these are just some echo measurements of it as well, kind of confirmed um, diameter of the neck of about you know, two to three um, in, a, in a fairly sizable uh, pseudoaneurysm sac. So our approach was to directly cannulate the LV apical pseudoaneurysm, and, and we uh, essentially did a mother, daughter, whatever you want to call it, telescoping a technique where we knew we needed a, a slightly larger bore delivery system to deliver the um, amplats or duct occluder, couldn't do it through a diagnostic catheter, so we took a, a 120 centimeter uh, Berenstein catheter and telescoped it through a, a, just a standard six French JR4 coronary guide in the hopes that the JR4 would give us a kind of a safe curve once we were in the pseudoaneurysm to not um, rupture the uh, outside of the sac. Uh, directed the Berenstein in, um, took a steel core wire with just kind of a floppy tip, something relatively benign, but still had some support, um, and kind of looped that in the pseudoaneurysm sac just for added support for railing catheters in. Um, and even with that, just with the five French catheter across by echo, um, we saw that there was a, a pretty marked reduction in the flow into the pseudoaneurysm by color. And so we knew that this wasn't a, a really sizable neck. It did have some length to it, but it wasn't a very wide neck, which was a good prognostic sign. Uh, and then it's hard to see on this left uh, movie, but that's our, we, you can see our JR4 kind of uh, tracking over the Berenstein catheter into the pseudoaneurysm. And then the image on the right is just the JR4 catheter in the pseudoaneurysm sac with just a, a little angiogram to confirm our location and make sure we haven't torn or ruptured um, anything, and, and at that point it looked good. So we chose a six by six amplots or duct occluder two, um, knowing that it, it could be delivered pretty easily through this um, six French uh, guide. It could probably have been delivered through a five French guide. We just didn't have five French guide catheters at the time, um, and uh, deployed it uh, into so that we tried to get the, as much of the waste into the neck of the pseudoaneurysm as we could. And so you can see that picture on the far right. Uh, we felt that the neck was uh, well, or the waste was well into the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. I uh, still see some flow through the device on that on the uh, angiogram taken through the uh, guide catheter, but significantly reduced compared to baseline. And we felt that was a good a good location for the device. Deployed the device, did our final angiogram, and uh, you can see there's markedly reduced flow. Uh, this essentially closed off, and by follow-up transthoracic echo, there was really no flow into this. Um, the next day, here's a, a picture of just really no residual flow by color into the pseudoaneurysm sac. So just a few take-home points of this. Um, you know, obviously the frequency of entering the LV uh, via direct apical puncture for TAVR has really decreased in recent years just with the advent of, of uh, new technology, smaller sheaths, et cetera. Um, with the introduction of transcatheter mitral valve repair technologies, of which many of them are transapical and many of them use large French sheaths, uh, obviously, the incidence of LV apical access is expected to rise over the next few years. Uh, the complications with LV apical access are rare. Um, 
but they can occur in situations where um, the myocardial tissue in that area is suboptimal. So those patients with prior chest radiation, chronic steroids, uh, cardiomyopathies, or if they just have um, very thin uh, muscle from a, you know, a, a big dilated cardiomyopathy, which a lot of the TM, TMVR patients probably will be uh, long term. Um, transcatheter repair of catheter-induced LV apical pseudoaneurysm is feasible and it's safe to do. Um, there are things, obviously, that, you know, planning is kind of everything with these in terms of understanding the anatomy, understanding the imaging, and then most importantly, I think, understanding the equipment and knowing what devices can be delivered through what kinds of catheters, making sure the catheters are long enough depending on your approach or if you need to come transeptal, um, and then obviously what devices are the best ones to use. I think most people would argue that the vascular plugs or the ADOs are good device options because of their very tight night and all weave conformability and flexibility uh, through delivery systems. And then obviously we have some unknowns um, about you know, risk of thrombus, incidence of recurrence, what the device durability will be, um, and you know, with larger bore sheets, are, are we going to have to consider using larger devices or multiple devices? <coughs> That's great. That's good stuff. So you're, this is an approach to fix the surgical problem uh, in, the tim in the new era. We're doing a lot of TAs for uh, mitrals. Uh, any thought to doing an upfront approach like this instead of closing primarily with sutures? Oh, and uh, on your way out, you mean? I think there's a lot of talk about that, and I know companies are designing those, those types of technologies, and I think there's a, I think it's very warranted to do, um, depending on the simplicity of it, I guess, and uh, it, I think it obviously would be better to do at the time. I mean, I think the other issue is, though, that we don't know what the incidence of this really is. It's, right. it's obviously a very low incidence. It's, it's not good when it happens. Um, so does it warrant doing it on everyone? I, I think that's a, that's a very debatable, debatable topic. Right. Even a trickle. Right, just from the pressure, the high pressure in the, in the cavity. You had complete closure right away, mm -hmm. which is what I think is what successfully Very good. That's good. Thank you. Great. Yes, that's him. Perfect. We're going to introduce Dr. Naidu, and he's going to talk about a sec uh, alcohol septa ablation that didn't go well, I guess. Yeah, sorry, I was finishing a, uh, another panel. It's a long time for nothing to disclose. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to present a case. This is probably my, uh, my worst case that I had over the past 15 years. We've done about 160 alcohol septal ablations uh, over that time point. Uh, this 77-year-old female with severe COPD, asthmatic component, hypothyroid, hypertension, sleep apnea on CPAP, um, di uh, diagnosed with severe hokum six months prior to admission, long history of COPD, and multiple previous admissions for COPD exacerbation, now on chronic steroids. So I'm painting a pretty morbid picture. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that. So two months prior to admission, she was admitted for heart failure with congestion, medications were adjusted, diuresed, and discharged home, and another steroid pulse was given on top of her baseline steroids. Her cardiac meds included KLNSR SR 120 QAM, she really couldn't tolerate beta blockers, Lasix 40 QD, and disapyramide ER 150 BID, back when we had the ER formulation. Uh, Non-cardiac meds included prednisone and synthroid. Her FEV1 was 1.4, so significant debilitation there. BMI 36, New York Heart Association Class 3, primarily dyspnea exertion. No syncope, no pacemaker ICD implanted. Long discussion with her about the contributors of her dyspnea exertion. This is typical that happens in some of these older patients with multiple, um, uh, multiple trigger points for her dyspnea, including her pulmonary disease, her BMI, her arthritis, her cardiac problems. And the decision was made to treat the LVOT obstruction as the immediately modifiable substrate. And I think in cardiology, we oftentimes do this. What can we actually do? And I think uh, that's one of the uh, challenges of a procedure that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that can be done, but certainly uh, can also have risk. So the patient was deemed a poor surgical candidate, so this wasn't an option to do myectomy at this point. Her echo showed moderate LVH, septum 2.0, and posterior wall 1.4. She had SAM. She had no resting alpha tract obstruction, but 50 with Valsalva. She had an echogenic scar at the basal septum, which you'll see at the point of, of contact, um, indicating uh, chronic diastolic uh, and or systolic uh, um, contact with the basal septum. She had normal coronaries with EF 65%. Her pressures were there. Her EDP was fine. She did have three woods units, which is not terrible, but her index was below two, indicating severe uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction in terms of perfusion. 
So resting alpha attractive obstruction was 20 that went to 80 with Valsalva and a combined maneuver 150 millimeters of mercury uh, with these two maneuvers. And this was consistent with significant cardiac component to reduce non exertion, uh, both diastolic dysfunction as well as uh, a systolic dysfunction from alpha attractive obstruction. And the ablation was performed. So you can see here that you have a basal septum that uh, has an echogenic area, so you can target this area with alcohol ablation. Uh, there's no MAC or anything that's contributing. The septum is uh, somewhat thick, uh, but not enormous. Uh, you can see a uh, SAM over here, the obstruction in the outflow track. Here's a VGRAM on the left, very hyperdynamic function, which is typical in this patient population. Certainly also with pulmonary disease is also very typical, and you can see a uh, first septal perfect that's pretty big. So this is, I'll tell you, also in our early experience of, of non-subselective uh, alcohol septal ablations. Um, so we, we, at that point, we're, we're, we're at, the, uh, at the phase where we would really ablate the entire first septal, as, as the initial literature was. And so you can see the first septal perforator. This is a cutting balloon. And you can see that septal perforator goes for the basal septum, but probably also a little bit to the mid-ventricle, as you can see there. And uh, after the alcohol ablation, you can see that that septal perforator is gone. The patient did well. This is also in the days where we had transvenous pacers from the leg. We now do them from the neck with a screw-in active fixation lead for earlier ambulation uh, and uh, longer monitoring. So this is a cutting balloon. She got 1.8 cc's of alcohol, uh, which I think is appropriate amount of alcohol for this kind of a septum. Maybe it's a little high compared to today, but still uh, relatively low. Her MCE confirmed good location, no distant <coughs> territory. She did have complete heart block for 15 minutes. That did resolve. Her final apoplectic obstruction was no resting of prolocal gradient, so she had an immediate uh, uh, surgical-like result, as Dr. Saraja sitting here would like to say. Um, TVP was sutured in place, A-line, angie sealed, and transferred to CCU at noon, pain-free. Um, so at 11 a.m., right when she's still on the table finishing up the case, her CK was 287, so that's pretty high initially. At 4 p.m., the CK is 1485, so a little bit higher than we expect, but uh, not too bad. At 9 p.m., patient described acute abdominal and back pain. So this is very unusual in the first day with a drop in systolic blood pressure to 80s and increasing dyspnea exertion. She was starting on levofed. I was already home. Uh, 9 p.m., her CK is 1347, so it was already coming down. So a very early uh, infarction that is coming down already. She was placed on 100% non-rebreather, 93% SAD intubated, and the stat echo was done. And the echo uh, was very hard to see everything, but you can see in this view the basal septum is very uh, somewhat thinned already, which is a little bit unusual. Um, and you'll see also in the subcostal, this was the only view that showed a VSD of the, uh, of the um, uh, septum. And again, this is within, really within uh, less than uh, 10 hours of the procedure, nine hours of the procedure, very unusual. So post procedural course, you have diagnosed with acute VSD at 9.30. TVP pacing was now 100%, certainly a bad sign. At 10 p.m., she was taken to the cath lab for a right heart cath and balloon pump. I did that. Um, this is not in the area where we did a lot of uh, impellas at the time. Her blood pressure increased to 120 on balloon pump, so it looked good initially with an RA pressure of 15. Uh, at midnight, she was taken to the OR, so we moved very quickly for acute VSD repair. On report, patient on chronic steroids, friable tissue noted throughout. Um, Intra-op TEE showed closure of the VSD, no residual uh, leak, and she was brought to the CQ on multiple drips with a lactate of 10. At 9 a.m., she was di diuresing and actually was doing well. Her drips were being lowered. Her blood pressure was down to 110. Um, or maintained up to 110. At 10 a.m., however, she had recurrent acute decompensation, likely due to patch dehiscence. And as was typically uh, seen in these types of cases, this kind of comorbid patient, the, patient, the patient's family typically does not have the reserve to keep going on these kinds of patients, and the patient's made DNR rapidly and expired at 10.44 a.m. So what are the teaching and discussion points here? Um, this is a case I regret, and I'll talk to you why that is. So alcohol ablation is for, patient, is for patients with comorbidities that contraindicate myectomy, but really doesn't mean that all patients who are denied surgery should get alcohol ablation. And this is sort of the high-risk PCI situation, or you know, everybody learns this when we do procedures, that there's some patients that probably um, are too far gone or, or, or have too high risk. Chronic steroids uh, use should be an absolute contraindication, I think, similar to the risk of surgical literature. We have not learned this as interventional cardiologists that these patients do poorly, and the VSDs and these kind of complications happen very rapidly within the first 10 to 12 hours. I think nowadays we do subselective alcohol ablation to be preferred, and I think also, uh, and I'm interested in hearing Dr. Siraj's view here because he's done this a long time as well, should we be preferentially find the septals that go just to one side of the septum as opposed to the entirety of the septum? If we can find the septals that just hit more of the LV side as opposed to the RV side, uh, will that result in a reduction in a transmural infarction that could cause VSD? Because I think this is still a complication that is dreaded, and we don't have good ways of predicting this and preventing this. Um, centers with LVAC capability might consider emergent impella ECMO to facilitate surgery and bridge to recovery. However, these patients are very sick, and they, they were sick for a reason that they came to the lab for alcohol ablation as a last-ditch effort, and they're not the kind of patients that people then want to do aggressive maneuvers with. So thank you. So Paul, Paul any thoughts about the case, or how will we prevent VSD in these patients? Is it case selection, or is it... Uh,
Yeah. Right. That, that first little branch may have done it. Because it was thicker there. And I think the mid ventricle was thinner, and, and so the mid ventricle was probably what blew. As an, as an interventionist, we all know we can start small and always add it's true. to it later. Um, in terms of my rule of thumb for alcohol dose, I usually start with one to two milligrams per uh -huh. So this was about that. It was a little bit higher, but nowadays I would have done it about a cc. Right. Just pl yeah. So we take these people now that come in with real PTSDs and we put them on uh, an LVAD and just keep them present for six weeks. Now, you know, if you can, you can wait six weeks and it's easy to fix, you're going right. to have to fix it. Then, you know, we still decompress it in some way. You can yeah. tell it now. I know this was earlier. Yeah, yeah. But this, this was doomed to failure. You poor guys, they didn't want to operate on it, which was electric. But well, then the question is how long do you wait? I mean, really, you have to wait weeks, right? For yeah, this. So They can't wait. You look at this patient here, there's no way this patient can tolerate an LVAD for six weeks. So what you're, what you're doing is, well, they can. They certainly can. Yeah. Yeah. I think we would have done that now, right? And you know, the center that I was before this, uh, before I'm, I'm now at Westchester, which we do um, heart failure transplant, LVADs, ECMO, everything, but at the other center that I was at, we didn't really have all that available in the middle of the night. And so I think, um, you know, I think as a community, we're really not able to tackle all these things. We, we, we forget that we can do a procedure, but we can't deal with all the complications at every hospital, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, so our next uh, speaker is going to be uh, our organizer, one of the organizers of this conference, Dr. Paul Saraja, who's going to talk to us about something new, papillary muscle therapy. Let's see here. Thank you very much, Samir. Um, so papillary muscle therapy, what could I be talking about here? Well, so here are my disclosures. I do have disclosures, despite that previous slide. So this was um, um, not my patient. It was one of my partners. He's an 85-year-old man. Uh, but I got involved with this patient, and you'll see how. So he was 85 years old, and this was about a year ago. Severe aortic stenosis, had porcelain aorta, and he had no access uh, anywhere. And so, uh, and you know, we look at the quadrants, we look at various things. We weren't doing transcable at that time, but uh, at the very least, uh, in the periphery, the only option uh, for him to get ta uh, TAVRA was a transapical approach. So he comes to the hybrid room, and uh, he gets TAVR. Uh, Richard, were you doing this case? I can't remember. It may have been you or Des, but uh, he gets TAVR. So on the left-hand side, uh, there's TE because it's transapical, general anesthesia. And you can see there, there's the TAVR uh, before and the TAVR after. So anybody know what happened? So, all right, well, we'll keep going here. So obviously, there's a lot more MR uh, after the valve has been put in, and this is what happened. So when your echocardiologist asks you what the ACT level is, it's never a good question, right? You never, because if they're asking you why, <laughs> well, they see something flapping around, it's, it's never good. So, so obviously, there's a papillary muscle that's been torn and ruptured, and it must have happened either during the sheath placement or during the valve advancement, at some point, uh, the papillary muscle got torn. So uh, at this point, um, uh, I was called to ask and give an opinion. Uh, any thoughts on how to fix this? He can't have surgery. He's got a porcelain aorta. He's inoperable. We probably would get sued if he, if he opened his chest. I think, Jonathan, you might have been there, so you can't say anything. Neocord or clip? Yeah, so we didn't have neocord, so it was clip. So, so, we, uh, so they asked me, could I clip and take care of this papillary muscle? So I said, well, we'll give it a shot. So here's a, a transeptal, and you can see the height here. Uh, this was uh, with the standard NT. Uh, height was a uh, four. Um, and then we uh, brought the uh, uh, clip here in the top right-hand side. And uh, it actually took 
no more than 10 minutes. Uh, it was actually really easy to get down, get underneath the, the valves. Uh, you can see there the, on the lower left-hand side the clip, the leaflets fell right in. And at this point, my thinking was, well, uh, where do I want the palpatory muscle to end up? Uh, because, you know, this is ruptured. It's flailing into the left atrium, flopping back and forth between left atrium and left ventricle. And I'm thinking to myself, well, nature wanted the palpatory muscles in the LV. So, so we kind of timed it to where you can see in the bottom right-hand side, if you look very closely, I don't know if my mouse plays here, yep, you can see the papillary muscle is trapped on the LV side. And so I think we, we got what we wanted, uh, and it looks uh, like it's better. Uh, the mitral valve is secure. And here's the MR. MR is fantastic. I mean, my surgeon was ecstatic. I don't have to do any, I don't have to open this patient. Yeah, he's gonna do okay. So any thoughts at this point as to what could be wrong or what could happen? I'll give you a clue. It's acute MR. Huh? Prolapse of the muscle. Prolapse of the muscle, yeah, I think that's, uh, it's trapped though on the LV side. No, LV was okay, but you're right, uh, uh, you know, you were leaving acute MR. So this is what was found. Gradient is 19. So the valve is small because this patient had no mitral pathology to begin with. And so the valve was small from the get-go. And uh, we put a clip on, remember the clip will generally drop the valve area by about a half. Uh, and this one, I think it probably almost entirely closed uh, the mitral valve. So now uh, the, the arms are closed, the MR is gone, uh, but she, he's got unlivable, non-survivable mitral stenosis. So thoughts at this point? What was the gradient before you released? It was in the two to three range. Oh, before I released? Yeah. I haven't released yet. <laughs> good. Very good. No, so the, so the, the clip is still, it's, uh, it's closed. It's, uh, it's still on the sleeve. Uh, sure. And the decision is, well, now what do we do? Because if I let this go, MR is going to come back. He's going to go so, into shock and so probably not survive. I don't think I've ever created. Pull out your tendine. Pull out the tendine? Well, we, we don't have emergency T. Uh, but you're right, uh, a, a retrievable, repositionable valve uh, in multiple sizes would actually be quite nice. And maybe off the shelf, uh, tendine in the future would be appropriate. So, Paul, you did this case acutely at the t immediately post uh, tabor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The patient was sick and all that stuff. That's right. So, the, the chest is still open, TA is still open. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I thought about that. I thought about letting the papillary muscle fly up. Maybe that's contributing to, to stenosis. So, what I ended up doing is I simply just opened the arms up uh, yeah. to about 60. And so that got the gradient uh, down to around seven. So this is a trick you can do uh, with mitral uh, clip. Uh, you can open it up, uh, I was sorry, not 60, 30 degrees or 60 degrees, depending on which way you view it, uh, around 30 degrees. That got the gradient down to something more acceptable is around seven and the MR, uh, while it's not completely gone, it's probably more survivable and I'll tell you, uh, the next day, the gradient on the transthoracic was higher. It was in the 10 range, but you know what? It was the best that we can do, and uh, we medically managed him, and uh, I think he did okay. I can't remember what he did down the line, but this is the best that we can do. So, so anyway, there, I think there are some interesting uh, teaching points here. The way I see this case is that this is a bridge to get him out of the hospital and survive his procedural event, because he would not have been able to survive it otherwise uh, with that papillary muscle rupture. Uh, and, uh, and him needing to have his uh, AS treated. So uh, you can repair uh, papillary muscles. Uh, I've seen this uh, um, not with just iatrogenic injury like this. I've also seen a case that was sent to me with post-infarct uh, papillary muscle ruptures. Uh, that patient, actually almost similar scenario, caused some stenosis, uh, but was uh, survivable. Um, I think about trapping the papillary muscle in the LV just because I think that's how nature intended it. But one thing for these, if you're thinking about doing this, beware the small size of the mitral valve because these are acute ruptures and you're gonna be acutely reducing a normal sized uh, valve in terms of the area. So thank you very much. Don't run away. <laughs> no, I, I was just wondering because other people might say, okay, this is an option. So from, from a device aspect, what angle can you leave it and it's safe to close? I mean, there must 30. be something in the, is 30? 30. Okay. Well, what, uh, 30? I don't think the IFU says 30, yeah. but, but it's 
commonly known. Uh, nice microclip, you can leave it at 30. But not more than that. Yeah, not more than that. Yeah. And uh, whether that holds true for XTR, uh, I don't know, because you're yeah. given an extra couple of rows of, uh, of, of uh, uh, gripper with XTR. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but at least with the uh, normal size clip, it's 30. I think this is one of a, it's a really important case for a lot of different reasons, uh, but um, we had a case of a, uh, a patient with a acute MR due to pap muscle rupture as well. And the patient did, we did the same thing and it, they, they did great, except for within two, three weeks, just the medical management, all these other yeah. things just became a, a yeah. horrible setup with dialysis and so on. The other qu things that we can think about in the future for something like this, I mean, uh, Pascal would be an interesting option mm -hmm. because of the spacer for, the, for mm -hmm. that stuff. And then um, other things, I think uh, with the apex open, was there any other option for thinking about even just doing a chordal setup? What yeah. other things could you so think about? So the surgeon didn't case? feel that they could get to the pap muscles and, and okay. do whatever they could to, to repair it. Uh, okay. They would have had to go on bypass, and uh, there was nowhere that they felt that they could safely cross clamp the aorta uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and put it and do cardioplegia to, to open up. I don't know, Mike, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And the other thing too is, you know, if you if you deem a patient inoperable, you have to be really wary about what you're willing to offer in terms of surgery. You know, I know of at least one case in which uh, a family sued. Uh, the physician because the, they operate on the patient when they determine the reason for TAVR was that they were inoperable. So, so you got you to be very careful. And so if they're inoperable, they're inoperable. And so, yeah. I, I wasn't there. Yeah, I wasn't there. I suspect it may have been uh, the wire probably uh, got entangled somehow. And when the sheath and the valve went in, it just it tore. Yeah, it wasn't during the BAV because they had done a BAV before. It was uh, after they put the valve in. So it was probably with the big sheath, yeah. All right, thank you. Good. Thank you, Paul. It's my pleasure to introduce um, my colleague from uh, Minneapolis. And I have to say his title is, is fantastic because Richard does what this title says. He gets us out of trouble. He's a, a you know, very good imager and has taught many people how to do it appropriately. We just have to set up your lab. Is it, is it warning? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a fantastic meeting. So I'm an echo guy and I get the pleasure of working with uh, Mario and Paul. So I have a short case here. Hopefully we'll catch back up on some time. Uh, we're highlighting just the simple imaging that was helpful. This is my disclosure. So we start out about two years ago. This is a patient uh, with mitral regurgitation um, who came for mitral clip, and uh, one clip was placed with a reasonable result. The issue was during the procedure two years ago, during device uh, prep, the handle wasn't pulled back, and that contributed to us getting stuck across the atrial septum. So the guide you can see in the upper right is on the uh, RA side, and the clip is on the LA side, and. Uh, uh, it just got stuck. You couldn't advance it, you couldn't withdraw it, and uh, that caused a lot of consternation. Has that happened to anybody before? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it was able to get through, and the procedure was performed, as you saw, but the problem was that, you know, we tore the, uh, the fossa there. You can see a big hole, you can see a piece of tissue wiggling, and there's bi-directional shunt so uh, decent mitral clip result, uh, big hole. So it was, uh, it was a 28 uh, millimeter uh, closure device. So, so far, so good. Uh, but it's actually two years later, patient comes back and he's got worsening mitral regurgitation uh, and it's medial and lateral to the clip. There's an eccentric component, uh, not a surgical candidate. Um, and uh, so thought it was reasonable that maybe we could try uh, going after this with further clips. So one of my uh, junior interventional echo colleagues uh, um, was doing the case and uh, 
told me that, you know, I could see the needle coming down the uh, SVC and on the superior portion, but then I lost it and I couldn't see the needle tenting. Uh, he kind of blamed himself. But, you know, on fluoro, you have some nice landmarks. You see the clip there, that's, you know, where the mitral valve is. You have this uh, ASD occluder device. And, you know, you could, uh, Paul's got the needle uh, posterior just on the edge. Um, but uh, my friend couldn't see uh, the needle tenting. So what would people do? Would anyone go through anyway based on the fluoro imaging? No? Okay. So they felt uncomfortable with it, and he kind of blamed himself, which he shouldn't have. He said, uh, bring him back when Richard's here, and uh, <laughs> you'll, you, you won't have any problem. So, you know, lo and behold, you know, I, same thing. I, I can't see the needle in that position tenting. Uh, so what do you do now? Do you go through? Anyone go through? So would you expect it to tent? Well, uh, at least to see the needle tip, maybe, it, yeah. if it's not on the device. Did you try staining the septum or doing anything else to help... Uh uh, mm -hmm. No, I don't think uh, we've tried anything. Um, you know, the other option is, uh, you know, get the late, this is a, you can see the uh, images were from an old IE33, well, get the latest <laughs> machine with 20D imaging. Do you think that'll help? Well, I, I think for a case like this, the fluoro can be used to help get across, but two planes are definitely needed, multiple planes are needed to make sure you go through it. And when you do go through, that you go through a perpendicular to the ASD. I think I had to close one watchman, uh, close an appendage like this, but it was very hard once we got through because we got through at an angle to make sure that we were able to still deliver the watchman in place. But it is doable, but you're, you're right, imaging is definitely needed. Right, so uh, this is the, the key image. Uh, this is a view that I always like to get from Mitroclip, even in our routine cases. It's a view of the left, uh, from the, atri of the atrial septum from the left atrial side. So you see the mitral annulus down at the bottom. You see the aortic bulge uh, at the lower left. And you can see that this atrium is kind of shaped like a um, field hockey stick. Uh, but the key point is that uh, you see the uh, wall of the um, inferior wall of the left atrium really abuts right against the uh, posterior part of this uh, a closure device. So if you would have pushed the needle through, you may have ended up in the pericardial space. So this view is uh, helpful. Um, oh yeah, okay, thanks. In, in routine cases too, because it, it really tells you where you cross in relation uh, to the uh, mitral valve, and it can t warn you if you're too anterior and you're gonna end up with an aorta hugger. But in this case, it was helpful. Uh, we know we didn't have room uh, in the ideal location posteriorly. So now your options are to go very low or to go very high. This is uh, about four and a half centimeters right here. So you'd be very high or you could go super anterior and try to battle an aorta hugger. Um, any thoughts? No? Okay. Well, uh, I did this with Paul and it decided, he decided to go through the device. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever described that before. Um, but here uh, we see that, uh, you know, to get the best chance of putting two clips in, uh, you probably want a good transeptal location. So uh, we, Paul used a bayless to get through, which was interesting. I think it gave some warning messages as the, the needle hit the night and all, on the, but was able to get through. And here we see it's a, a reasonable site. We thought that maybe going to close to the periphery, the discs might move and cause some interaction. So it's a little bit uh, closer to the middle. And then, uh, then the next problem is, well, how are you gonna get your guide through there? Uh, and so Paul uh, does a balloon dilatation. Uh, and then with some finagling, we're able to get the dilator across and the guide into the uh, LA. And we were, were able to place two more clips, medial and lateral, to the original clip. We got uh, some braces here. Uh, nice, reasonable result. Um, but, you know, we do have uh, some shunt left across the occluder device. It's not bidirectional. It's all left to right. Um, we weren't quite sure what to do with that, so we, we left that for now. But would anyone try to put another device inside that? Show us next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
just a, a, a short case highlighting that uh, you know imaging um, doesn't necessarily have to be fancy, but uh, certain views can really help you in certain situations. So uh, this is the topic uh, I was given. I got lucky. It's a mitral case. 85-year-old gal in 2002 had a mitral valve uh, replacement with an Edwards bovine pericardial valve, 27 millimeters uh, for uh, posterior flail. Progressive dyspnea, functional class 3, comorbidities as mentioned there, CKD, severe pulmonary hypertension, severe lung disease. By echo, she had prosthetic mitral valve gradient of 15 to 17 on the right-hand side. That's a 3D view of that valve. She had mild MR, EF45, moderate TR, PA pressures in the 80s and no coronary disease. She has high risk for surgery, like all of our cases that we present, unfortunately, these days. Hopefully, that'll change. Uh, here's our CT um, that we did in preparation for a, uh, a mitral valve and valve. So the aortic mitral angle looks uh, favorable at 129. And the bottom left there, you can see that uh, an S329 valve within that bottom prosthetic valve looks good, like a nice fit. The Neo LVOT 285, so nice and generous. And then the uh, the relationship between the fossa and the mitral valve, uh, very important here with this horizontal heart. And you can see um, how the, uh, the transeptal puncture is going to be incredibly imperative here. So our procedure plan, our focus was really on the transeptal uh, puncture given that fossa mitral valve relationship. We figured an inferior posterior towards a mid fossa stick might be best. We've been using a uh, energized transeptal uh, metal needle, so with a bovi for most of our cases, but this one in particular to avoid any sliding uh, when we're sticking the septum. You know, we access the LV with an agilis, pigtail, safari wire like we do uh, for all these cases. We balloon the septum somewhat aggressively with a 14 balloon. I think we've gone down in size on the balloons as we dilate these septums these days, but we use the 14 in preparation for this 29 valve. We also floss the septum a little bit with the partially inflated balloon, trying to make sure that the trajectory felt right and it looked good and felt good and all that stuff. We also use an embolic protection uh, device for this uh, stenotic bioprosthetic valve. That's what's shown on the left here, not terribly relevant for this case. Here's our transeptal puncture just in one view. I should have included the uh, Short axis view as well. It looked like we we're about three and a half centimeters away from the valve uh, where our puncture was at this time, so we went ahead and did that. And then we got what I thought was a pretty good looking uh, angle uh, into that LV through the mitral valve. Looks like a nice, easy sort of uh, shot through there. We, uh, we balloon the mitral valve. We don't always do this. Uh, we balloon the septum twice. You see a little waste here and then uh, no waste there. Soon after this, we just did a quick uh, floss through. So all good so far, but this transcathal heart valve just won't cross this septum. So uh, as I advance uh, up the IVC, uh, the delivery system, everything would just push through the roof towards the roof of the LA, uh, just could not get this thing uh, coaxial through the valve, despite what was a very pretty picture and a nice trajectory on the wire. So we did multiple, multiple maneuvers. We flexed and unflexed the delivery catheter. We clocked and counterclocked posterior anterior. Um, uh, we tried maximally pulling um, the deliver uh, sheath back as far as we could safely, so it was less uh, hardware there going through the septum. We tried pulling and providing tension on the wire to give us a nice trajectory into the LV. None of this stuff worked. We then thought to maybe do a uh, buddy or bumper balloon technique. So, uh, you know, we have a transeptal, um, excuse me, we have a, uh, uh, a TVP through the contralateral vein. So we removed that sheath and put in a new one and then put a, an eight millimeter balloon through the septum uh, and inflated that to low pressure and then tried advancing the THV uh, through that way. I thought that would work, uh, didn't. Uh, the, maybe we got a little bit further with the transcatheter heart valve, but we still couldn't uh, entirely get it through this uh, septum, it, it was stuck. So then we decided to more aggressively dilate the septum with a tie shack balloon, 18 millimeter. You can see that looks, looks too big. Uh, but we had, we had hit it with a 14, and, we, and um, we just figured we'd go to an 18 at this point. It's not super obvious maybe to this presentation, but this is, uh, this case is frustrating, trying to get this thing through the septum. So we went with a big balloon. Mm -hmm. Still wouldn't cross. They were stuck at the same spot. This THV just won't go through. So uh, I guess I could open this up to questions or what would people do next, but in the interest of time, I can just roll through this. You prefer that? Sure. Okay. Um, so what next? We've manipulated the delivery system every which way I could think of. We've uh, buddy ballooned or tried to bumper this thing through. 
Uh, we've tried to essentially grenadoplasty, just, uh, just no respect for the septum with an 18 Tyshak balloon. Then we thought, okay, maybe we should externalize. Maybe we could just put a little four French in the LV apex, grab that wire, pretty simple. She's a bad lunger, real bad lunger, uh, with an STS of 18. Uh, we can also just externalize old-fashioned uh, mitral valve valve, but I'm not a big fan of that. So what we decided to do was to snare this uh, safari wire in the LV going through that same transeptal hole that we had uh, already created. And on the right-hand side here, you can see, or on the left, you can see the echo. And on the right-hand side, you can see how we've uh, snared the, the uh, safari wire um, uh, in the LV apex. And then we pushed on that snare device to keep it in the LV apex. And you can see that with this, this is real time. This is the first approach. It just slipped right through there. Just by that little bit of pinning into the LV apex with that snare, without making a new TA puncture or externalizer or anything, it worked uh, just beautifully. We are able to expand uh, this 29 in there quite nicely. We got a little bit of a ventricular um, placement of this, but it was just fine. The valve looks good. Mitral valve uh, gradient was three, and there was no PVL. Uh, amazingly, the septum survived this punishment. We just had unidirectional shunting, we d and uh, so we didn't, we didn't close this. You know, that's our preference, is not to close these things. Thanks very much. I think that's a great case. I was uh, telling uh, uh, Dr. Gissel here that uh, after that grenadoplasty, it didn't matter where the valve was going to go in, the patient was going to feel better. Because <laughs> yeah, it would just really, really the LA pressure. Yeah, really That's the LA true. pressure. Corvia um, would be happy. Right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and you guys are a great enroller for that. Um, but now thinking about this in advance, this could be something that you could even do in the IVC, right? So you cross in the IVC, have a snare there, make sure it's set up, put all of that into the uh, ventricle, and then go from there. I, I really think so. I mean, it, it takes no time. Um, for whatever re and you could, you could maybe even... Yeah, you can maybe even advance everything through with the snare in place. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's where you're getting at. Yeah, so I think that's right. You, yeah. you made one uh, distinct point where you said you're not a big fan of the transapical access. And I, when I work my, with my Elvit surgeons, they always say, you know, why did you not ask for help? Because I could do a six French, even four French if you want to do it, uh, sheath through the apex with a small incision and really help you out a lot. So, right. so what, what is your argument against that, I well, guess? Well, we, we could do it one better. We could put a four French there and not make an incision. And you yeah. can pull a four French out of the apex, right. uh, yeah. usually, yeah. and not that I've done it a hundred times, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and not even close it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, she was a longer. That's the, main, okay. that's the main reason. I don't think she would have tolerated it. This turned out to be, uh, I don't know, would you have preferred that presentation? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this is, I think this is better. You know, I think this is... Uh, <laughs> Brown? Yes, you know the catheter that the ensnare comes with that you, you... Just use that. Just putting a little tension uh, just to keep that... So you can follow that wire down. That's a great point. Yeah, we'd have to go back, look at CT, yeah. Yeah, great point. Hey. Excellent, you know, outstanding technique. I had one comment that one thing you can do sometimes that works for us is not to try to advance the entire system, uh, but just push the balloon as if you are going to uncover yeah. the balloon because all mitral valve involved, that really is the key that just as soon as you cut off the septum, sometimes it doesn't even return. Yeah. Yeah, so in addition to pulling the pusher back to advance, I think I, I hear you. Yep, no, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, that's right. Yeah, we definitely tried to time it with the breathing. That's, those are great points. Awesome. Good, thank you. Thanks,